All right, that's my cue. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the fourth event of our Summer of Book Fest speaker series. My name is Nicole Cook, and I'm the executive director here, well, not here, at the Western New York Book Arts Center. And I'm joined today by my co-host, Rosemary Williams, who will be taking your questions as we go throughout today's event. So please make sure to good, make good use of that. Man, I'm all over the place today. <laughs> make good use of that chat box. Can you all tell it's Friday? <laughs> um, if you're engaging with us for the first time, the Western New York Book Arts Center is an arts and cultural nonprofit. We're located in downtown Buffalo, but we've been serving our community with programs like this over Zoom during the COVID shutdown. We specialize in letterpress, screen print, book binding, origami, and we offer educational opportunities for all ages and abilities. Um, we are Buffalo's only publicly accessible letterpress studio. So once the COVID ban is lifted and we're back in business, please be sure to come visit us downtown. The speaker series is presented by our friends at the Printing Industries Alliance. And Kim Tezzo is here to share a bit more about the great work that they do to champion print as a contemporary medium. Kim? Thanks, Nicole. We're very excited to partner, and this is our last in the series that we've had some great webinars from our other members, and you can see their recordings if you missed them, but I'm looking forward to hearing from Grover Cleveland. They're our neighbors here in Amherst, and they never say no when I ask them for a favor. <laughs> I was just over there the other day, so. <laughs> but Printing Industries Alliance, um, we serve uh, printers located in New York State, Northern New Jersey, and uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, with different services such as human resources and uh, money saving services, short sale programs, and workers' comp, those all kinds of things. So, we're looking forward to the webinar today and um, happy to partner with Book Arts. Thanks. Thank you, Kim. And now I'm excited to introduce today's speakers. Tom and Mike Deegan are the owners of Grover Cleveland Press, which is located in Amherst, New York. Grover Cleveland Press was founded in 1947 by Tom and Mike's father, Jim, at the age of 14. It has excelled at offering different printing techniques to make their clients' designs stand out from the competition. They offer digital offset printing and specialty finishing techniques. They've been awarded many local, national, and international awards for their craftsmanship, which will be on display in their talk today. All right, Mike and Tom, take us away. Okay. Uh, hi. Hello, everybody. I, yep. I'm Mike, and uh, I'm going to give just a little brief history of Grover Cleveland Press, and then Tom's going to go through and show the different uh, techniques and processes that we do here. Um, as we're going through, if you have any questions, uh, just let us know, and uh, we'll try and answer them as we're going. Um, Grover Cleveland Press. Um, was started by my father. Uh, he was a ninth grader um, at Burgard Vocational High School in Buffalo. He was um, uh, interested in the whole printing process and he um, had heard from friend in school that uh, they were trying to sell a little letter press for you know, um, $50 and he decided that, uh, hey, that's a really good idea. I'm gonna buy this, uh, $50 letter press, which also came along with a little bit move of uh, movable type. And I'm going to print these uh, little jobs for, you know, customers in the neighborhood and around town. So he bought the press, he set it up in his uh, parents' uh, basement. Um, he used that press for three years. Um, and he got to the point where it was getting uh, to the point where he was spending more time repairing the machine than he was printing uh, different jobs. So he had heard from other kids in school that uh, there was a press coming in from Europe that uh, was going to be set up. There was a store downtown called the Big and Little Store, and it was going to be set up uh, in this store to demonstrate the different uh, techniques that it could do and uh, how, more, how much more efficient it was than just a hand-fed uh, press. So he went uh, to the store um, and checked it out. And at that point, you know, he was a junior in high school and he decided, uh, wow, this is like the uh, greatest thing ever that, uh, you know, I gotta 
see if I can uh, swing the deal to get this press. And at the point or at the time, you know, the press was uh, a $3,500 investment and he didn't have that type of money. Um, he had told his uh, parents about the press, uh, but at the time it was nearing the end of the depression. So they, you know, they didn't have enough money, but they uh, thought enough of the process and in his uh, entrepreneurial skills that uh, they loaned him um, a portion of the money and he had also saved up money from doing the uh, projects uh, for customers for the couple of years. Um, so he bought the press and my grandmother had enough foresight to uh, tell, uh, it was a Heidelberg windmill and my grandmother had enough foresight to tell the, uh, or to write into the contract that this press was this cost, but it was set up in their basement. So they said, oh yeah, that's not a problem. We can just take it in through the side door and down the steps. But to come to find out when the press was delivered, there's no way they could get it. It weighed 3,800 pounds, so there's no way they could get it down the stairs. So they had to pay someone to dig up their backyard, drop it, uh, you know, right down to the base of the foundation, knock out the wall, drop the press into the hole and through the wall to get it into the basement. And then they had to block the, you know, the wall back up and fill it back in with all the dirt. So they did do all that and they didn't charge them any extra to do that. But that's kind of how the business, you know, took off a little bit more from there. And he had done more and more jobs um, with that press. He graduated from high school. Uh, he turned 20 years old and um, he got drafted into the Korean War. Um, at that point, um, his last payment to his par parents was a month before he got drafted in the army. So he had a, he paid off the press, but then he had to go over to Korea for two years. Um, and he, uh, once he got over there, he was able to uh, wrangle himself into a position where he actually worked in the only printing um, outfit army printing outfit in Korea. Uh, they, they printed maps. Um, if you look on the left hand side, that's one of the maps they printed um, while he was over there. Um, it was the first time that maps were actually printed of, the, of Korea um, since the Japanese took it over in 1930. Um, he got through the two years of the war. He came back. Um, he started, uh, or he, got, he decided that, um, okay, this working in the basement is great, but I got to figure out if I can really make a living doing this. So I got to rent a building and um, uh, do this full time and see exactly where it takes me. So he bought, a, or he rented a spot on um, Niagara and Amherst Street, and he was there for three years. Then after that, um, his father was actually a carpenter. So his father um, and some of the people that worked with him, uh, as well as my dad, they actually built the building um, on Bailey Avenue um, in Amherst, uh, which we were there, you know, till 1998. Um, in 1998, we also uh, uh, bought a piece of property here on Sweet Home Road in Amherst. And again, my dad uh, had some of the construction blood in him. So he uh, wanted to build this building also. So he was the uh, project manager uh, of this project here. And, he, and we built this 12,800 square foot building that the business presently resides in. Um, and now I'm gonna um, turn it over to Tom and let him talk about you know, the different things we do. Um, we, you know, we do commercial printing, but we also do specialty effects. Um, so uh, I'll turn it over to Tom. The one thing that uh, I was just going to add to the history that uh, Mike was just talking about was um, my mother's uh, father. They had no introduction through printing, but it turned out that my mother's father was also a printer. 
and he worked at Niagara Lithograph. Um, so the, in the picture uh, on the left-hand side, the dinosaurs across the top, that's something that was printed at Niagara Lithograph on a 40-inch press. It's two sections, and it was an eight-color job. So, or actually, I'm sorry, a 10-color job. So at that time, uh, it was before CMYK inks and everything. So they ran it through the press 10 times um, uh, on each section of that to make that poster that's up in the top corner. So, um, so I'll start today with uh, going through our offset uh, um, setup. And offset printing is probably the most common type of printing available today or at least for us, it's the uh, most common thing that we do. Um, it's done with a lithographic process, uh, which uses the um, concept that oil and water don't mix. So um, when people think of offset printing, it's the technique that provides high quality printing that we can use, get consistent results for both long and short run projects. And you can use it from anything from folders and brochures to booklets, to catalogs, wedding invitations, um, whatever your imagination can come up with. Um, we can usually figure out some kind of a way to make that work. So um, to start the offset process, we would burn a plate. That was there, our, our plate maker, um, one of the advances that we made in green technology or trying to stay green was uh, to get that plate maker and our plates are process free plates. So we don't use any harsh chemicals or anything like that. that used to be required to process the plates. Now they're processed with the water that's used on the press. So this is a image of a plate um, from a this is a magenta plate from a job that we we're doing. And you can see that the areas where the ink is, that's the coating that was left on the plate um, after it's, it's a laser that burns the coating off. So that's the coating that was left on the plate um, and that attracts the ink and the coating that's washed off, that leaves a coating that attracts water. So that's how the image stays in, in where it's supposed to go. And then it's transferred to a rubber blanket and transferred to the press. So here's an image of our um, bigger press. It's a Komori five color press. Um, it'll run a sheet that's 20 by 28 inches and it'll run at 13,000 sheets per hour. Um, you can see here are the different units. So this is a gray color that we were using. Uh, this one is the black unit. Here we have the cyan ink in this one, the magenta ink here, and the yellow ink is in this unit here. The last unit here, um, we can do aqueous coating, so that puts a protective coating over the image, and it also helps us to produce the jobs that don't offset onto the sheets behind them. As our operator is running the press, he'll pull sheets out to check them, and he puts them on his checking stand. This has a um, densitometer built into it, that reads the color strip along the bottom of the sheet. So as you can see, it's starting to run across the sheet now. And so when you get a box of cereal or something like that, and you see those little color strips that are on it where there'll be three or four colors up in the corner of the box, that's the same process that they're using there to keep the color in, uh, consistent. So as it reads it, then it sends the, press, the information over to, our, to the uh, computer and the operator can see that um, whether he wants to, you know, add more ink or keeps it consistent as he's running the press through. So that's sort of a quick overview of the offset and now I'll get into foil stamping and embossing. So um, the foil stamping, it uh, is a process that uses heat and pressure to transfer foil onto the paper. So the start of it is that um, we'll get a PDF in or you, can designate what you wanted in your PDF as foil. Um, then we'll work with the die makers to decide what is the best die that we should use. There's a couple of different options. Uh, brass is the most expensive and probably least common one that we use, but that one has different options that um, it's mechanically engraved and then it can be hand tooled to add in some other special effects. 
Copper is the most common dye for us, and we use that because it has a long life. Um, it really conducts the heat uh, very well, and it's photo engraved. Um, so the benefit of copper is its uh, hardness, uh, which aids if uh, when we're running the job, there's a sheet that gets misfed or a jam up in the press, um, the dyes don't get damaged. So magnesium is the other option, and that one is more for short run jobs. And the disadvantage of magnesium is that it will wear out as it's going through. So if you're using like a heavily textured paper or um, you know something like that, or if there's a misfeed on the press where it puts in two sheets or something goes in sideways, the dye can get damaged. And then we'll have to either take it off and try to repair the dye or get another dye made. So that is the different dyes that we do. Um, but when a foil element is put on, we use it to enhance the job and really make things stand out. So as you can see on the right, uh, the headline there is in silver foil. And um, so that really helps the thing pop out. Uh, there's many, a wide variety of foil choices and finishes and holographic foils and prismatic images and everything else. So there's just a myriad of options for you to use when you're doing the foil. Um, and so when we uh, get a job in, we'll help you um, decide on what kind of papers, if you, know, if you have any questions about the paper, we can help you decide whether um, that's going to be a good option for what you're doing with it. Um, we will help you with the imaging of the dye, so we'll let you know if we see front lines that are too fine or, you know, areas that are too bold or type that's too small that's not going to reproduce well. So we'll try to work with you in all those things so that you can get the best uh, job possible. So um, I'll switch on to some uh, things about embossing and then try to tie everything together at the end. So the embossing is, uh, that's done on the same presses that um, we do the foil stamping on. And the embossing is a process where we'll have a die mounted on a, um, on a honeycomb pattern. You can see here the dies being mounted. That plate will go into the press then and it will be heated up to like 200 degrees. So the heat and the pressure from the press will reform the fibers in the paper so that it maintains the image that we emboss on it. So um, again, with embossing, uh, there's different dyes that we use and um, different images uh, are, are possibilities with the different dyes that we use. Uh, the cheapest way to make a dye is out of copper, um, and that one will be photomechanically done. And so you basically get like a flat level and um, a flat level uh, of image. If you want something more detailed, then we go to like a brass dye. So this is one here that you can see the dye is on the press that we mounted earlier, that was brass. So the uh, interesting part of the brass dies is that these are all highly skilled uh, craftsmen that, that make the dies. So we'll send them an image that we want and what the idea is, and then they'll look at it and we'll go through with them uh, to work to what was gonna work best for that image. So um, they will actually, um, Here's a die style chart. So you can see these sculpted ones up in the top right corner. Uh, those are done where they hit, those are brass dies and they will go in and by um, hand grind out all the detail in there. So the part that's amazing is that they're not only grinding it in reverse, uh, you know, for the printing, but they're also grinding it into the plate. So it's the opposite of what we're gonna get. So but they've been doing it so long that their brains have been retrained to just work in that option, you know, in that way, in the same way that most printers can read type that's backwards, they can just look at it and know what they're doing in it, even though it's backwards in reverse. 
So um, we, we do have a question um, about the dye makers. Are they located here? Do they work with, with you at Grover Cleveland or are they a separate company? We work with, uh, there's a few dye makers locally that we work with on occasion. And for the more detailed stuff, uh, we work with a couple of dye companies in Kansas City. Um, and the reason that Kansas City became the like center of the world for dye making is because that's where American greeting cards uh, um, or Hallmark cards were based. So all these guys got their training in the card, you know, the greeting card industry, and then they sort of branched out into other things and, and make dyes for other people. So, um, so that's where the dyes are made and uh, we will, um, but they're a very good company. So they can usually turn things around pretty quickly. Um, a copper dye, they will send us that back usually within two days. Wow. Brass dye usually takes three or four days for them to do, depending on how detailed it is. So, um, so that usually works pretty well. Um, mm -hmm. And another thing with, uh, so I guess get, getting back into the embossing, when we're deciding on how to do the embossing, uh, the paper makes a big, um, you know, choice in, in what we're going to do. So if you're doing a job that has real deep embossing, then you need a heavier, stronger sheet that can handle that, that depth. Um, another thing to think about while we're designing the embossing is um, the different depths and things that you want. So the, if you have a very fine line, that's hard to make very deep because it doesn't have the width to, you know, the paper to be able to stretch in there. So the paper will just cut through if it it's a fine line. So we'll work with people on that to tell you like this should be made bolder or, you know, that different type of stuff. Um, so in the dye styles chart here, uh, this is something from one of the books that we did probably 30 years ago before we moved here. So it has the wrong contact information down in the bottom corner. But um, during this, uh, COVID event during the shutdown, we were actually went through a bunch of our shelves and we found that we have a lot of these sheets left over from one of the books that we did um, that won a bunch of international awards back in the 80s or 90s or early 90s. So we've decided that we are putting some of those together and we'll have some of those books available for people. So if you're interested in one of those, um, you can shoot us an email and we can ship one out to you or even if you're in the area stop by and and we'd uh, be happy to give you one but it will go through and it's a book on the um, not only printing but on the native american heritage that's uh, involved in the area so um we we did have another question tom about the the dyes and i see you're getting into it too um when you have a dye made for a job does the customer own it and keep it after the job or it, do you uh, the, the customer job? does own it so um we handle it in different ways depending on what the customer wants to do so we could you know we can keep it here on hand and um keep it here so whenever you need it the dyes here but if it's something that you like back we would work with you there too to give you the dye there and then you can store it for future use so um that's something that you know we are are open to different options cool thank you so but if there aren't any more um questions about uh dyes or embossing then i guess i'll move on to die cutting um and that's Again, that's done on the same presses that we use for the foil stamping and embossing, but these are done without heat. Um, these are done with a steel rule die uh, that's made. Uh, so we'll put in, um, for the cutting areas, the dies are a little, the rule is a little bit higher and that will have a sharp edge and that'll cut through the paper and then we'll also put scores in so that the you know paper can fold the right way and all that. So um, you can see on the side here, where our, uh, this is one of our presses that's running a pocket folder right now. Um, so it's feeding it in and the die is 
cutting out the, the pocket folder right out of there. So, so there's many options available for the shapes and size that you can do back in the um, prior to the computers being involved in everything, it was another like uh, craftsman type of thing where the die makers would cut the plate, the uh, image on the, into the base of the wood, and then they would bend all these rules, the metal rules by hand and fit them into the right area. So it was a highly skilled job now. Um, they're still highly skilled, but they do it with a laser cutter that will cut the image in, and then they have computerized bending machines. So the ability to make complex shapes now is something that is um, pretty available, where back in the old days, that was really something that was not really available. So um, here's a job that I was just going to show that involves all three of the processes that I was talking about so far. Um, this is a job that we ran through um, on our uh, offset press. And then after we did the offset printing, we foil stamped it. So you can see that the uh, snowflake image has like a, it doesn't show that much on the picture, but you can see there's a slight, like a holographic image in it. So it was a, like a sparkly snowflake when it was finished up. So um, here are the dies and the press sheet that we did. So you can see the brass die and how that's hand sculpted to the different depths and rounded and, and all that. Above it is the counter that mount, and so the brass die will mount on the heated side of the press. The counter will mount on the platen, and then it will be squished between the, you know, the platen and the counter, the paper will be squished between the platen and the counter to come up with the image. Um, the copper die next to it was the foil that we put down. So you can see that on the sheet also. And then the last die is our die cutting die that we had made with all those complex uh, you know, fingers for the snowflake. And the other part of the die cutting die is the uh, black rubber on there is, is in the position so that when the die cutting die, when the paper is squished between the platen and the die, it doesn't get stuck inside of those little fingers that will cause the paper to be ejected from the die and then it can be you know pulled out of the press um, properly so so tom another question from deb is the snowflake foil stamped on both sides and if so how does that work when you with the heat that you have to apply so the foil is uh the snowflake is stamped on both sides and um the foil is fairly permanent once we stamp it down. So the stamping on the other side, it won't affect the foil on the other side. The one thing that you do have to take into account with the foil stamping is that due to the pressure that's required on the paper, sometimes that image will show through on the other side of the plate page. So if you're foil stamping like over a, you know, a color picture on the other side of the page, you and it's a thinner paper, there's a good chance that you're going to see like a, the impression uh, from the die on the back of the page. So that's something that we would, you know, um, work with you and, and let you know while we're doing it that this might show through to the other side. So we might want to reposition something or choose a different kind of paper, you know, for this process and everything. So, um, mm -hmm. So if there's not any more questions, then I'll, I can move on. Um, so the last thing that we do here is digital printing. Um, and that's actually become quite a bit more common in the last 10 years. Uh, when it first started out, the machine, the digital presses were really expensive and the quality was not nearly as good as what you could get from offset printing. Um, as time, you know, with any technology, the presses got cheaper and the technology got better. Now, the digital presses are almost equal to or equal to what you can get with an offset press. So um, the digital press that we have here, it's um, 
able to print on a wide variety of media. We can do plastics, um, textured papers, smooth papers, um, just about uh, quite, a, quite a few different, I was gonna say just about anything, but of course, there's always something that somebody comes up with that we, that we can't work on, if, whenever I say something like that. So, um, but we, there's a wide variety of things that we can do with it, and it can print on media from like five and a half by eight and a half up to 13 by 27 and a half. So it can do a, like a banner sheet, um, different things like that. The other ability that we have with our particular press is in addition to the CMYK printing, we can print with white and clear toner. So I'll just run through a quick example of the white toner uh, that we, a job that we did for a promotional piece. Um, and that's my golden retriever, retriever Zola there. Um, so she likes to come down to work. Uh, she doesn't like to be left alone at home. So she'll come down to work with us, you know, a few times a week um, or a few times a month and come in and like to greet all the customers who come in and all that type of stuff. So Zola was down at work with us one day and uh, one of the guys who works in our pre-press department, in addition to being a pre-press, uh, you know, expert, he's also an excellent photographer. So he had his camera with him at that day and Zola was in, um, in his office laying with him. And so he looked down and he, you know, saw her laying there. So he picked up his camera and took this picture of her. And then as he was looking at it, he thought that would be a great um, example to use for the white uh, foil or the white toner printing on our machine. Mm -hmm. So to, to get the image to work for us, um, we converted it to a grayscale image and we silhouetted the areas out that we didn't want to print and we filled them with black because when we're printing the white, uh, especially with an image like this, um, we're actually going to print a negative image of the picture that we want in white toner and we'll print it on black paper and that will give us the image that we want. So after we got to this point, um, we inverted the image. And so this is the image that we're actually gonna print with the white toner. Um, and so to do that, we went in Photoshop. Um, there's a few ways to do it, but the easiest way is we went in Photoshop and we went into the duotone option. We changed it to a monotone image. Um, and in the monotone image, you name your ink color. So it's, we had to name it white with a capital W and the processor on our digital press, then when we send the image over, um, it will see the areas that are designated as white and it will know that's where it's supposed to put the white toner. So the final image I have here is of Zola printed on black paper. And then you can also see that the line, you know, the line art for our company logo and text and everything all comes out and stands out very, very prominently and so the this is something that is actually prints much better on a digital press than it does on offset presses on offset presses um, they call the ink opaque white but it's not very opaque so if you print it on a black paper um, or any color paper it picks up the color of the paper that's underneath it so we would probably have to hit the you know run it through the press um, three or four times to even have it come close to the quality or the, you know, the opacity that you're getting through the digital job. And we've actually never tried to do um, any kind of images on it or anything like that. So, um, so that's the, you know, our white image. Um, Tom, we do have a question specifically about that press that you were using. Um, what model digital press do you have? Question from Becky. It's a, uh, ours is a um, Heidelberg uh, digital press that's actually made by Rico. So it's a Rico, uh, I think it, the model is called the Pro C7100. So um, it, uh, you know, it's a, it's a press that can be configured in a bunch of different ways. And so there's many different options for it. So we have like a booklet maker that goes with it and, um, 
Uh, and so we got it configured with the fifth color unit uh, that will do the white and the clear. So I could just, uh, I'll just mention a few things about the clear toner. Um, it's something that we don't, uh, we were kind of excited about, but we don't use it as much as we thought we would. Um, the clear toner works best in certain situations. So it doesn't, uh, if you use it on an uncoated sheet, it doesn't really stand out um, that well, like a, like a UV coating or something like that would. Um, so it works best with like a coated sheet. And if you're using it, um, it works like for security purposes and things like that. Um, it's really effective uh, for like highlighting parts of images and things like that. We thought that would be really great, but it tends to blend in with the image. So if you're gonna use it like over an image, it's actually something that works great if it's like not an organic part of the image. So if you wanted to put text over the top of an image, then the clear would, that would be something that the clear would work great with. If we were trying to highlight like the words in the Grover Cleveland press sign, we would probably put that on. And the only way that you would really see it, it would be if you were like tilting the sheet back and forth like this to get the glare, you know, you would see the glare on it. So the, the clear is something that we work with everybody to, you know, help you with and give you a sample of what it's gonna look like and work with you to get the best effects out of it. So, um, so I think that covers most of the stuff that I was gonna talk about today. Um, if there's any other questions or any other things that anybody has, you know, that anybody wants us to talk about, um, we can go into any of that. Yeah, definitely. We do have another question. Um, do you get out of state work because of all the specialties and equipment you have, not just local, local jobs? We do do uh, stuff um, for different clients out of state. Um, we have a few art galleries in New York City that we work with quite a bit. Um, we have, you know, people in other areas that, uh, that will send stuff into us. So we do do things for people in other areas. Do you have a, a favorite job you've ever worked on? <laughs> or one that stood um, out? Probably uh, the job that I was talking about, uh, the, the, about the Native American history around Western New York is uh, probably one of the favorite ones that I've done because that was back when I was still running the embossing and die cutting presses. So, um, so that job, I was, um, you know, we were all heavily involved with it. Uh, my father had a lot of the ideas for the different pages and content that we did. And then we worked with the local um, Native American uh, cultural um, center in Niagara Falls to make sure that we weren't doing anything that was offensive or, you know, improper or anything like that. So, um, so they went through our book and they, you know, changed a few things and they actually, um, for it, let us borrow one of the uh, wampum belts that was from, that was, uh, they used to buy something from George Washington, or it was like a, something that was, went back to that era and they allowed us to use it to take it to be photographed. And so that was one of the pages in the book that explained the wampum and the images on it and all that. So that was probably one of my favorite jobs. And then um, we ended up winning a bunch of international awards uh, with that. So um, it was something that was fun to work on and it's still around that we use, still use it today. Can, can you remind us how to get a copy? I know that you mentioned it a little bit earlier. Um, on the slides, you can, uh, you know, you can give us a call or shoot us an email um, or even stop in. We're on Sweet Home Road. So if you want to stop in, we're always happy to show everybody what we have here and what we can do. And uh, so, yeah, we're happy to send one out and, um, you know, show you what we what we can do and give you the different uh, options. Thanks. Um, and I had a I had a question just as I was looking at all your presses. Um, how what what are like the ages of your presses? How old are they? What's your oldest press? Your newest press? 
Okay, so we still have the, uh, Mike was talking about the windmill press that my father bought when he was in high school. Um, we have one of the last versions of that. So that press is from like 1972. Uh, so we still use that. Um, we don't use it so much for uh, printing anymore because we don't do that much letterpress printing anymore, but we use it a lot for uh, like scoring small jobs or small die cutting jobs because that will do die cutting and scoring also. Um, then we have another older press that we don't really do printing on anymore uh, that we use for scoring. So that's in the mid 70s. And then um, our next presses are our foil stamping and embossing presses. And those presses uh, were based on the same technology that's been around for since the 1930s. They've just been updated with better quality and enhancements to make them work you know, better. So uh, one of them we have was from 1987 and other ones from like in the 1990s and the 90s one was just when computer and automation stuff was being, uh, you know, brought into that process. So um, our offset presses that we use are quite a bit newer than that. So our big press, uh, that one, I think we got in 2007. And so, um, so that one is still turning along pretty good and uh, everything's still going good with that. And then we have a couple other smaller offset presses and our newest one of those um, was in from 2014. So, um, and the two big offset presses, the newer ones, those ones are both, um, more computerized and automated. So they will get the, all the image information from our pre-press department and that gets sent right to the press. So the operator doesn't have to manually set ink densities and uh, image registration and everything. All that stuff comes through to them and they mount the plates and um, the press is ready to run, um, you know, a lot faster than it was back uh, before we had that technology, so. Thank you. Um, and then I think uh, a, a more of a comment from Richard, I'll just read it out. Maybe you can speak to it. Um, based on his experience, digital printing is not offset, of course. Uh, the biggest difference is not um, with printing CMYK images, but the printing of tint builds, especially with large tint areas. The smooth printing of tints would be at the mercy of the color created. The tint could be, um, not a word I'm familiar with, but modeled. M-O-T-T-L-E-D, Motlid, maybe a printing term. Um, yes. A first off proof would be recommended. Exactly, that's correct. Um, so the, the difference between offset printing and uh, digital printing, um, with digital printing, uh, the easiest thing to print is just a solid chunk. So, um, so you can print like a big giant reverse of the sheet and you'll get full coverage without any uh, little marks that in the printing industry we are known as hickeys um, in offset printing where you'll see like a little dot on the prep on the image and what happens is a piece of dirt gets uh, like a piece of paper dust will get stuck on the plate and then that gets transferred into the image so then you'll have this one little dot in the middle of a big reverse and so as you can you know, tell with the press running at 13,000 sheets per hour, if something like that gets in there and your pressman doesn't notice it right away, that can cause a lot of problems. And so you can waste a lot of paper that way. So in the digital world, um, it can lay down great solids and do great images because of all the different interaction between the colors and the images. But if you try to do a solid like tint of like maybe a 50% and browns are probably, I think the worst because they're a combination of all four colors. Um, you'll get a modely image where it's uneven and, you know, um, so in, there are advances being made where they can use different types of screening and things like that to improve the quality. Uh, but if you do have large, uh, tinted areas um, that does cause, you know, does show up where you'll notice that that, that isn't as smooth as and a, a good quality is offset. Thank you. So, um, 
So I guess the other thing that we do here is a, a little bit of bindery uh, stuff. So we have a stitcher trimmer machine so that we'll, we can do um, small saddle stitch books. And, uh, and then for all our bigger, um, more in, involved jobs, we send those down to Kathy at Quality Bindery. <laughs> <laughs> we all know each other. <laughs> right. Too much fun. Um, Mike, I know I, uh, Tom answered, but do you have a favorite uh, job that you've all worked on or you both spoke so wonderfully about um, all the artwork that your parents have been involved with in your office, something, you know, that really speaks to you that you have in your, in your building? Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with Tom. I mean, that uh, one job we did uh, about the, um, the promotional piece we did for ourselves was a lot of work and it uh, was something that you know, you don't turn around in uh, two or three days. It's, it's something that took us three or four years to get it to the way we wanted it. Um, so, you know, you have a lot invested in that. So you really do um, feel good or you feel good about that. And then, you know, the results we got uh, were really, uh, it was really well received. So we were very happy about that. But I mean, there's a lot of jobs that, uh, I mean, the crazy part about this business is everything seems like it's always in a big rush and uh, you look at a job uh, a month and a half after you deliver it and you think wow this was really neat but I didn't think it was that neat when I was doing it I was just trying to get it done um, but it there are I mean there are a lot of uh, advantages um, the other side of it is if you know if you have a nice collaboration with the artist right from the beginning um, there's a lot of benefits to doing that because there's a lot of hurdles that uh, you can smooth out in the very beginning and you don't have to run through um, and start changing stuff as you're going through the project. So, and uh, along with that, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that I think Mike's favorite job is actually one that should be coming out um, probably sometime in the next few months. And it's a, um, piece that we're uh, collaborating with uh, a good friend of ours um, who is at White Bicycle um, Advertising Agency, Brian Gruner. And so uh, it's a job that actually has gone back probably, uh, we've been working on it for about 13 and a half years now. And, uh, <laughs> and it's gone through many iterations and, um, it was the, the length has, you know, the length of time that we've been working on or talking about it was, uh, you know, a combination of uh, Brian and us where we were all excited about doing something and we got to a certain point and it got held up and then he was excited about doing something. It got to a certain point and held up and it's gone back and forth like that over the years, but we finally have reached a spot where we got some good momentum up and um, it's something that we're getting to the final stages of the design on now and, and working out all the different papers and techniques that we wanna use. So it's something that we're hoping to be able to send out in the next month or two. So. Oh, long time coming. <laughs> exactly. Um, and I think, um, just be mindful of everyone's time, perhaps the last question, unless somebody wants to feverishly type, um, what's your average turnover time for prep and proofs for an offset versus a digital printed project? And then um, your pricing in relationship to um, printers uh, downstate. Um, I can, I yeah, guess I right. can answer that one. Um, to turn around, uh, dep I mean, depending on what the actual job is to turn around a digital job. I mean, generally it's a couple days to do something like that. Um, you know, if it's something that is, needs to be done even faster than that, it's, you know, it's definitely doable. Um, a offset job, you know, you, you have proofs involved, which usually is a day or two. Uh, then once it's okay, it's probably like another four or five days to print it after that. Again, depending on what the actual job is. Um, the pricing from, you know, it's 
from here to downstate, I would say that it's definitely cheaper here, um, especially on some of these uh, more intricate involved invitations. Um, I think that's the reason we do get some of these uh, um, jobs from art galleries and things downstate. Um, but I, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's fairly comparable. It's not like uh, it's half as much here as it is there or anything like that. Yeah, I was, I'll just add that I think it, it, we are probably a little bit cheaper or, you know, a bit cheaper than downstate. Um, then the one thing that we have to add in then is shipping the job down there to, you know, so that adds to the cost. So depending on, and like Mike said, depending on the jobs and the quantities, um, you know, uh, that's what one of our pressmen says. That's what he loves about working in the printing industry is that every day is completely different. And he comes in and, you know, he, we do repeat jobs, but the variety of work that he does um, is always something different and interesting. And um, he likes, you know, the fact that he gets to see all these different things that come through. So, um, um, I'm going to let Richard, he's been asking a lot of great questions. So, um, he, one last little question from him and then, and then we'll close it off. I'll, I'll bring it over to Nicole to say some words. Um, but do you recommend your clients sign off on a first off proof prior to printing the digital project? I know we do custom work here, so it's always good to have folks like, yep, it's good yeah. to go. <laughs> no, I mean, getting it signed off is definitely, uh, you know, it's something that we, pretty much uh, require um, and our proofs both for the offset and the digital are a lot, a lot of them are done on the digital equipment because they're all um, coordinated. The uh, um, profiles and everything from the offset press is also the same profiles that we use for the digital press. So the color uh, is consistent from one image or from one unit to the other. Um, we, you know, it's, it's always best because, um, if you don't get the, uh, sign off, then everybody always comes back and tells you that, uh, this, uh, word was uh, spelled right on their file and now it's spelled wrong, which is generally not the case. So, um, so yeah, sign offs are good for everything. So, and, and we, um, and again, the sign offs uh, depend on the timing, you know, uh, I mean, we do do jobs where if it's something where it's a tight turnaround and it's a pretty standard looking job, we might uh, just use a PDF as a sign off where we would send a PDF after we process it, we'll send it back to the client and they can go through and check it for content and color and everything. And then, um, you know, we'll go from there with it. So. A lot of times we do a hard proof or and other times, depending on the timing or the, you know, it, uh, complexity of the job, we'll use PDF proofs also. Thank you. So many great questions and so many great answers. I appreciate it. Oh, uh, I'm going to bring it over to Nicole now. Let's see here. There you are. There I am. <laughs> Uh, first, I just want to say my apologies to anyone I was distracting in the chat coming up with the idea about a event for shop dogs and cats to paw print their way into our hearts. Uh, <laughs> definitely going to be following up with PIA on that later. <laughs> um, but anyway, thank you so much, Mike and Tom. This was awesome. Um, I was totally geeking out over all those videos that you added in of the equipment and of your space. It was really a super multidimensional tour, and that was awesome. So thank you very much for putting so much detail into your presentation. Oh, well, well, thank you. Us. And I'll have to thank my daughter, Samantha, who did, uh, who did most of that for us. So. <laughs> so, uh, well, thank uh, you, Samantha. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I also just wanted to say thank you to the Printing Industries Alliance, who's been such a great friend to us for years now. But uh, Kim Tezzo really you know, put a lot of effort into helping to reach out to PIA members and helping this series to come together. And it's been really awesome to connect with our Printerly community even if we can't all be physically together. Um, and in fact, it's given us the opportunity to connect with some folks who are outside of the immediate Western New York area. So I think it's been a huge success. And so just claps for Kim. <laughs> so glad everybody said yes. <laughs> <that we had. laughs> 
Um, and so this is the last PIA member talk in the series, but we are going to be continuing because BookFest goes through Labor Day. So on September 4th, we have a speaker from AIGA, who's been our marketing partner in this series. Um, they're a graphic designers organization, so not necessarily printers themselves, but folks who work kind of adjacent to the printing industry. Um, and AIGA member Renee Stevens is going to be sharing about her book called Powered by Design. And so she's going to be talking about everything from the concept to the publishing to the printing to the distribution. So that should be a really interesting talk for anyone who's interested in the book contents as opposed to the book printing. <laughs> um, so we hope you'll join us for that. You can register on our website, wnybookarts.org. Um, same as the other talks in the speaker series, it'll be presented for free. We will send you a link and we will also send you email reminders. <laughs> Um, so thank you to everyone who joined us today. We are really grateful that you cut out an hour to learn about printing with us. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, thank you, everybody. It's great. Great job. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great weekend, everyone. Enjoy. Too.